Good afternoon. On behalf of the Center for Community Progress, I'd like to welcome you to the May edition of our Cornerstone webinars. My name is Justin Goddard, and I serve as a program officer for National Leadership and Education here at Community Progress. Cornerstone is our monthly webinar series that equips participants with the building blocks to understand and solve tough challenges related to property vacancy, abandonment, and deterioration. For today's Cornerstone, we are joined by Karen Black, who is the CEO of May 8 Consulting Incorporated, a woman-owned social impact consulting firm. Black is also a lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania in the Urban Studies Department and a senior research fellow at the Drexel University Lindy Institute for Urban Innovation. In addition, she is the co-founder of the Healthy Row House Project, an initiative to improve access to private capital for home improvement loans that has leveraged $100 million in public and private capital. Black's firm, May 8 Consulting, performs policy research, analysis, coalition building, and facilitation to form innovative and creative solutions to seemingly intractable problems facing urban, suburban, and rural communities. Black's research and coalition building has supported the creation of many innovative state and local laws and policies that address problem properties and attract new investments. Before turning it over to Karen, I want to mention that we will allow time at the end of the presentation to answer questions. If you have a question during the presentation, please type it into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your browser and send it to all panelists. Finally, if you experience any technical difficulties, please use the chat box to message the Community Progress host or send an email to Justin Goddard at jgoddard at communityprogress.net. And with that, I turn it over to Karen. Thank you, Justin, and thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I am joining you from a high-rise office in Philadelphia where they are having problem with their fire safety system. And so at any time a siren may go off, I apologize in advance, but there's nothing I can do about it and just know that I'm just gonna keep moving through the presentation. Um, we're here to talk about blight and I wanna start with some good news because if we were talking about this about a decade ago, we would be talking about how cities and towns are managing decline and accepting blight as just a necessary part of the landscape. And that's not what I'm hearing now. And I've been at this for a long time. Um, I'm really hearing different things from professionals. I'm hearing, first of all, from local governments that they're no longer waiting for the market to catch up, right? And therefore they don't have to deal with blighted properties. They're no longer saying this isn't government's problem. The owners need to fix this. They're no longer crying out about property rights. Um, for those of you who are joining from Pennsylvania, you may know Cindy Daly from the Housing Alliance, and she had this great line, which is your right to extend my fist goes only as far as the next person's nose. And yes, you have property rights, but those rights only extend as far as they won't harm your neighbor. And as we're about to talk, when you have a blighted and deteriorated property, it incredibly uh, harms your neighbors and those around you. And we're also no longer underestimating the importance of code enforcement. Code enforcement officials really are first responders. They're incredibly important to our communities. And I wanna talk a little bit about why that is. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about why code enforcement is important what is strategic code enforcement as opposed to complaint-based enforcement, how to create a successful enforcement framework, key strategies when you're dealing with rental housing, and then key strategies when you're dealing with owner-occupied strategies. My goal is to talk to you for about 45 minutes and then save time for questions at the end. And Justin has told you how to ask those questions. Um, I have worked with towns and cities across the country, and I have never seen one make change with respect to vacant and blighted properties without first stating that the status quo is not acceptable. They are not just going to keep mowing the lawns or demolishing the properties when they become health and safety risks or boarding them up and reboarding them up. And there have been studies like this across the country, but I use Philadelphia's because uh, I got to write some of it. And we basically found that 
vacant properties cost local governments every day, right? Just in annual maintenance, direct cost, we're talking $20 million. And most of that is police and fire. So if you are in a town or city where for every fire call or every police call, you're actually noting whether it's a vacant property or an occupied property, you will note that a huge number of resources are going to dealing with vacant properties. Obviously, delinquent property taxes are a problem, um, particularly in cities that don't have automatic foreclosure after a certain period of time, and lost home equity. Um, property values decrease about 30% when you're in or around a vacant and blighted property. And that difference in equity, if you think about it, is enough to pay for college for your kids or retirement. It's really important. Um, on the other hand, there are huge benefits when eliminating blight. Uh, one study that uh, I'm gonna talk about even in more detail later, but I just wanna put it out there, showed that when you address blight, when you um, board up a structure neatly and put windows and doors on it rather than plywood. When you clean up a vacant lot and green it that was trash strewn, uh, you reduce gun violence by 39% and assault by 19%. So your code enforcement budget is your public safety budget. It's really important that your leadership understands those connections. You also have an incredible opportunity to improve the health of your residents. Charles Bronis, right here at the University of Pennsylvania, where I teach, did this amazing study where he fitted people with uh, little blood pressure checkers um, around their wrists, and they uh, walked past blighted properties in their neighborhood. And whenever they went or came across a property that was blighted, that uh, seemed unsafe, their blood pressure spiked. And then, amazingly, the same funder gave him the money to fix up each one of those properties. Just the exterior, it no longer looked vacant, uh, it was maintained, and those same people crossed and their blood pressure did not spike. And I want to make clear that this test was of residents who live in the neighborhood who are, quote, used to the condition. These are not visitors who have never seen a blighted property before. Every day they're going past these eyesores, these unsafe spaces. It has an impact on their health. As I mentioned before, raising surrounding property values uh, by 30% just by greening a vacant lot. That's amazing, right? We're all trying to, to raise property values so that the properties are at a price where you can rehabilitate them and get your money back when you go to sell it. And of course, it increases tax revenues for the city and the school district. So I said at the beginning, we want to talk about code enforcement, but we wanted to talk about strategic data-driven code enforcement. And there's a big difference, right? Many of us have complaint-driven enforcement, which means that a tenant has to call a tenant has to risk eviction if they're found by their landlord. It happens a lot. I know it's against the law. It also means that what you're doing as far as resources is running from one side of town to the next. And you may be dealing with specific complaints, but you aren't lifting up the quality of all the housing in your city or town. Think of it as saying you want to fix the roads and make sure everyone can drive, bike, or walk safely on your roads, but you're just responding to complaints about potholes and you're going to the north of your town, to the south of your town, to the west of your town, running around filling potholes, you'll never have good streets. And so it's much more cost effective to plan to hit every single building, uh, owner-occupied buildings, the exterior, residential buildings, the interior, vacant buildings, incredibly important, and keep up on what their condition is. Whenever you do code enforcement, I would argue, whether it's complaint driven or uh, much more strategic, the goal is compliance. And this is really important because as I've talked to code enforcement officials over the years, I've said things like, you know, if you're going to go into a neighborhood, send out a flyer telling everyone you're coming. Tell them what the top code violations you cite are. 
tell them how to fix them if possible. And I've had code enforcement folks say, well, they're going to fix it just before we get there. Yes, let them fix it just before you get there, right? That's your goal. And it's really important to keep that in mind, particularly when I met with um, a mayor yesterday who said to me, yeah, we can make about $2,000 in 10 days from code enforcement. We're starting to rely on that. Um, okay, but that's not the goal. The goal is not fee collection, and you have to keep remembering it. You want proactive and systematic process where you're going from building to building, and you want a database that shows all of the violations over time. And this is really important because one of the things I hear fairly often is that the magistrates or judges who um, are dealing with these code enforcement cases aren't really taking them seriously. They give owners continuance after continuance. Uh, they give them small fines, certainly not enough to get them to fix up their property. And so having a clear database not only will show you where you should put most of your resources, because with code enforcement, typically, we're spending about 50% of our resources on the good owners, and we want to spend about 5% on the good owners, right? We want to identify who they are, make it easy on them, not burden them, and spend our time on the owners who are um, either blighting our neighborhoods or um, are posing health and safety risks to their tenants. Um, Self-financing. Code enforcement should be self-financing. Several states like Pennsylvania or New York have rules that you cannot charge more in fees than it costs to administer the program. But fines and penalties, you can charge whatever is reasonable. Um, and you want as much as possible to put that money back into code enforcement. Um, places like uh, New Orleans and Toledo and Hartford, if any of you are um, listening, um, you actually put that money into a dedicated fund for code enforcement. Most places they put it in the general budget, but it should be a money maker or at least sufficient to finance all of your code enforcement needs. You should motivate the owner and it should be fair. I hear this from landlords all the time. Wait, I have a vacant property next door that has been blighted for 10 years and you are going to cite me because my tenants didn't bring back their garbage cans the day after trash collection, um, you really do want to be fair and you want to prioritize. And if you do this well, you create a tangible threat. You create clear standards and you get people to comply. And more importantly, you get those who would not comply to start paying attention because so much of what we do and so many of these tools are really just trying to get the owners from I'm going to ignore you, just go away, to how much time do I have to get my property into compliance. And there is no one magic bullet. Um, there are many, many different tools. Uh, this graphic comes from a publication um, I authored for the Housing Alliance in Pennsylvania um, looking at every tool authorized under state law, who's using it in the state, how effective has it been, what is it costing them. And it's called Light to Bright, and it's on the May 8 Consulting website if you want to look at it, particularly if you're from Pennsylvania. If you're setting up a town or city for success in addressing blighted and dear deteriorated properties and preventing more from happening, it's very important that you have a law in place that prohibits things like three non-working vehicles sitting in the front yard or weeds and grass that exceed three feet, right? For many communities, the easiest way to do that is through the International Property Maintenance Code. If you adopt it or if your state adopts it in a mandatory way, it is updated every three years by experts in the field, and it basically says these things must be fixed on the exterior of your building, um, and you are allowed to customize it locally. But you can also just put in place a local ordinance that says these are the things you cannot do because these are the things we're seeing frequently that are harming our neighborhoods. 
But in addition to that first category of tools I've been talking about, which involves strategic code enforcement, you also need to have some tools in place to address those long-term vacant properties where code enforcement has just been ineffective, right? And you need to publicize the use of these when you do use them because these are the things that drive compliance. So um, you want to, for the owner who has refused over and over and over, maybe for years to fix their properties, to use whatever tool your state allows you to. And there are very different tools in, very diff in different states. I'm familiar with quite a few of them, but I'm just gonna talk about a few examples here. So asset attachment. This is something that was passed as part of Act 90 in Pennsylvania that basically said, if you have a property in the city that you aren't taking care of, and then you have a lovely McMansion in the suburbs where you're living with your spouse and your children, we can attach that lovely McMansion to get you to pay us back for all the boarding and sealing and mowing we had to do on the city property that you've been mothballing and expecting the city to take care of. What's great about this one, I have to say, is it's never been used to my knowledge, but the threat has been incredibly effective. And it was passed in Pennsylvania because there was data to show that there were an awful lot of local owners who were just living in the suburbs. And maybe they had a place in the city or maybe their Aunt Edna died and they were just gonna leave it there and hope for a windfall later. Eminent domain. This is a long-standing tool. Most jurisdictions have had it in place since 1945 and it is incredibly controversial. But one jurisdiction decided to try to take each of the worst properties in their community through the eminent domain process. It's costly, it takes about a year. The no owner has to be notified again and again. But what they found was throughout that year, many owners, in response to the threat of government taking their property, sold it or fixed it up to the point where there were only 5% left that had to, uh, where the, the town had to actually finish the process and take those properties. That's really important when you're talking about lead to leadership or the public, uh, because that 5%, although it was a big cost, you actually got a lot of bang for your buck because you got all of those properties to be improved. And it's really important in all of these to follow through. The threat of eminent domain, if you threaten it and then don't take the properties in the end, you've done nothing. It is very much like me. I am a mother and my son comes home smelling of alcohol way after the time he is allowed to come home. If I tell him that he is going to go up to his room and I am not letting him out until he goes to college, that will not be effective unless well, no, I can't leave him there until he goes to college because he still has high school, right? It's an empty threat, just like having a one-year criminal misdemeanor punishment in your code. If you don't follow through, it means nothing. Receivership. You can go to court and ask the court to appoint a receiver in neighborhoods where there's sufficient value that if the receiver fixes up the property, they can then recover their money by renting out that property or selling it. In the early days of receivership, it was really difficult and only nonprofits could be receivers. Today, neighbors can be receivers as individuals, for-profits can be receivers, local governments can be receivers. It's being used more frequently and it's been effective. Opening the estate of those zombie properties that no one owns uh, is really important. Some states like the zombie law in New York are targeted at those places where the bank started a foreclosure process and then just stopped. So the owner's been kicked out. The owner doesn't think they own it. The bank never finalized it, so they're saying they aren't the owner. How do you stop that cycle? And then land banks, which uh, have been the subject of other monthly webinars um, where you actually create an agency that's really responsible for solely looking at blighted and vacant properties and getting them uh, in shape, either taking them 
or um, forcing their owner in some ways using some of these tools to start paying attention. All of these different strategies require you to bring together allies and partners. That's why so many of the successful cities and towns have had task forces that bring everyone together. So when a fire uh, personnel go to a property, they can say, this is a vacant property. Uh, in their database, you're sharing that information. And the one cautionary tale is if you're gonna bring all your allies and partners together, you also have to say, who's responsible for what and within what time frame, right? Because otherwise, you have a whole bunch of people who are responsible for part of the blight story and uh, no one is actually going to make it a priority because it's not their primary mission, right? That's really why land banks have been founded in so many places to have one place with a primary mission. But even when you do that, you still need to bring all these players in. It's incredibly important. And you need to target your resources because everyone has limited resources. Um, the former director of housing and community development in Philadelphia once said that he put $8 billion into Philadelphia's neighborhoods and he didn't change the trajectory of even one. Right, because if you're doing it so that you're responding based on dividing it up into every city council district or responding to the latest crisis, you're not gonna have an impact. And it's the same when you're addressing blight. You have to say, what are the three to five worst properties? Let's deal with those and then we'll move to the next three to five worst properties. And that's not obviously true of strategic code enforcement where you're trying to hit every one, but for these penalties that really impose a cost on government, you want to prioritize which are the worst and reserve the harshest penalties for those absentee owners who have the assets to pay but refuse to invest them. The last thing you want to do is cause someone to walk away from a property who wouldn't. And so you have to treat those people who just don't have the assets differently, hopefully offer them some incentives, and we're gonna talk about some of those incentives. And really, and again, this is a whole presentation of itself, you have to understand your various markets. Because in some markets, if you were to say, you must in fact replace your roof, and it'll cost $11,000, those owners would say, okay, because their property is worth 180,000 and there's no way they want to take the chance that they would lose that property. If their property is worth 13,000, a reasonable person is not going to spend that 11,000. And you need to know that. As much as possible, you want to ask owners to do something about their property at the time when they want something from you, right? This is really important. So um, I'm going back to my teenage son for a second. If he is watching a great show on TV and I tell him that it's time to take out the garbage, I've got about a 10% of a chance of immediate response. If he comes to me and says, can I have the car keys? I want to go out and I say, huh, the garbage needs to be taken out. It will be taken out immediately and instantly. And that does translate to owners. If they want a permit for another property and you say, well, you get that permit for another property, but only when you fix these code violations and you can do this in states uh, like New York, Pennsylvania and others, not all states, but some, pre-sale inspections are really wonderful when you're talking about out-of-state owners because out-of-state owners are the, really the toughest um, to get to do anything. And yet they want to sell property in your jurisdiction. So whether you want to say to them, you need to inform the buyer of any and all code violations on the property, or you wanna say, you have to fix them prior to selling, it is an opportunity, right? Um, and then registration of vacant and rental properties is really, really important. So you know what you have and your people um, who are owners in your town have a sense 
of what they're supposed to do. Other examples, New York City and Philadelphia say you cannot evict a tenant unless a legal landlord is registered there. Minneapolis checks registration when they create a water account. So every time they create a water account, they check the registration. Um, and Minneapolis, by the way, charges $6,000 per property per year to register a vacant property, and it has been upheld by the courts. Um, when you do database and systemic inspections, you achieve results. And I really want to talk about impact for a few minutes, because that's what you're trying to do. So Los Angeles uh, went and inspected all of their properties. And it took them from 1998 to 2005, because when you get behind like that, when you haven't been doing it, it takes a while to create that database. But they got 90% of their multifamily stock corrected. They made $1.5 million, $1.5 million violations, and it resulted in a $1.3 billion reinvestment by owners. Right? I know this is at a large scale, some of you go to, are in charge of small towns or interested in the small towns in which you live, but uh, the idea of high impact is really relevant. Philadelphia Doors and Windows is worth talking about for a few minutes, in part because the courts have upheld it as legal, and in part because there's been two studies showing its impact. So Philadelphia had 60,000 vacant properties, right? They lost 25% of their population. Uh, if you're looking for a small victory, we're down to 40,000 vacant properties. Um, but what they decided to do was they required all structures on blocks with at least 80% occupancy to have working doors and windows. No plywood, no masonry, working doors and windows. And for every day that the owner failed to do that, they would be charged $300 per opening. And if you picture a Philadelphia row house, that's five openings, so $1,500 a day. And keep in mind, once again, that the goal here was not to collect fines, but to gain compliance. So many of these fines were forgiven, but the focus was on stable neighborhoods, which for Philadelphia is defined as 80% occupied, for some of you, 80% occupied, right, are the worst of the worst neighborhoods, but this was Philadelphia. And then they brought these owners to Blight Court. And I just want to define what Blight Court is because it sounds like it's a separate entity and something special. All Blight Court meant was that every Tuesday and Thursday, the same judges and justices, district justices, came to hear the code enforcement actions. So they became really familiar with the owners. This is really important because when you have an owner coming in crying poverty or promising to fix up their property immediately, and then you can show that they have nine other properties or the judge has seen them in there again and again and again, um, it really makes a difference in how the judge treats these. And of course, educating your judiciary on the importance of this is something that's will achieve great benefits. So there were two studies, one by the University of Pennsylvania, one by the Reinvestment Fund, which is a community development financial institution here in Philadelphia. And what they found was that most owners complied, that the incre they increased the surrounding sale prices by 74 million. Remember, this is just putting real windows, real doors on properties. Increased transfer tax revenue by 2.34 million, which means these properties were being sold and reactivated. And then huge uh, decrease in crime in the area. So let's talk for a minute about specific strategies for problem rental properties. Um, so there's two kinds of rental registration, rental licensing are both proactive reg regulations, basically saying that we want to keep up these rental properties, that renting out properties is a business, and we are going to hold the owners to a standard. Registration says, just give us the information. You own the property, how many rental units, and you have a local agent. So if there's a problem and we want to say stop using Roundup because we just found out it causes cancer, we can reach all of our landlords. Licensing says in order to rent a property in this town, you need a license. And we can pull that license if you're not in compliance. 
And at the bottom, we're going to talk about that for a few minutes, is performance-based licensing. We're actually treating owners differently depending on how they care for their properties. For all of these, the goal is to know who the landlords are and how to find them. And to just provide incentives and reward for responsible landlords and hold irresponsible landlords who are providing substandard units, hold their feet to the fire a bit. So rental licensing, you're basically saying if you want to rent, you need a license, it's annual, and perhaps, and many do this, we get the right to inspect those properties every year to make sure that they meet basic livability standards, right? And by the way, Seattle, Washington just passed a law that said if your property doesn't meet basic habitability standards, you cannot raise the rent. That raises a few questions as to can you rent people things, units that don't meet those standards, but let's keep going for now. You want to make the system, whichever, whether it's licensing or registration, cost effective for your city. You want to automate it. You want the fees to cover the costs. And you want to outsource in some shape or form if you don't have the internal capacity. So one way to do this is create a property database to track properties and landlords, score the properties annually, and then adjust the inspection schedules based on performance. So Brooklyn Center, Minnesota does this. They do a regular inspection. And then once you show you're a good property owner and your property is in good shape, they will come back every four years. But if your property is in bad condition, they're going to come back every six months and they're going to require you to file a remedial action plan where you state what you're going to fix every week or every month, right? They aren't saying you have to fix every code violation right away, but you have to have a plan. And you want to reward responsible ownership, right? There are good landlords. They're important to your economy. Owner-occupied pro properties are different, right? Because the Constitution says that you have a right and ex expectation of privacy in your own home, and so you can't enter without a warrant. So what you're trying to do is identify issues early before they become too costly, provide assistance where there's inadequate financial resources. One jurisdiction I worked with found that when they put code violations that look like official letters in people's mailboxes, they got upset. They felt you were calling them a criminal. Um, but if they put door hangers that were a pretty color that said, look, we've noticed these things. We wanted to warn you now before we come back next month to issue violations. Um, those were met as friendly and neighborly, and they got a lot of compliance. So you also have to experiment and see what's going to work in your jurisdiction. Another jurisdiction found, quite frankly, that they were hiring code enforcement people who were related to or friends with almost everyone they were inspecting. And it made it very awkward. Um, and often those inspectors really don't want to. Right? They don't want to, to issue violations to people they care about. So in those places, they found that either shared code enforcement by joining the town next door um, so that they can inspect each other's properties uh, or outsourcing it because there are a lot of third parties who do this work, work more effectively for them. Another thing that's been effective in some places are quality of life ticketing or sweeps. And this is permissible in your state if you're allowed to have administrative violations rather than violations that must go before the court for a hearing. Uh, and a judgment. So in these cases, you're basically issuing a ticket, almost like it's a parking ticket, right? And the idea is two things. One, it's easier on the owner of the property because they just pay it and fix it. They don't have to show up in court or respond to the court. It also means that the money you collect goes into the municipality's coffers rather than the courts. And it's been fairly effective. Again, this is one of those areas where there has to be follow through. You can issue these tickets, but if you don't do anything with the people who don't fix it and don't pay, word will get out like wildfire, right? Everyone's going to know, and people are going to stop paying attention. 
Um, the other good thing about the tickets is that uh, you, when you get a response and you go to court, if you bundle all those cases together, you can bring it before a court. Um, this one uh, magisterial district judge in Cole Township had an owner before him who said, I'm too poor. I cannot fix these properties. I don't receive enough in rent. And they were able to show that this poor owner had nine properties. And the judge said, okay, sell four and fix up the other five. Some properties are just nuisances and every state has a nuisance abatement code. Um, learn how you can use that to say this is a health and rate safety risk and uh, it's a nuisance and we are going to place a lien on the property for what we have to do, whether it's demolition or repair, and we'll recover our costs through rental or sale. And I want to stop um, with what I think is a really good program and then answer questions. Um, in many of our cities and towns, leadership understands that the quality of your home that you live in affects your health. And hospitals, health systems are starting to do home repairs, to come into the home and see whether that person who has chronic diabetes and keeps coming into the hospital actually has a refrigerator so that they can keep fresh produce, or the child with asthma has black mold growing on their ceiling. Governments have also paid attention. And they said, look, if we can um, make sure that owners' homes are not blighted and are not deteriorating, we can achieve so many things. Yes, we improve their health, but we also revitalize the neighborhoods. We create neighborhood jobs. We can slow the decline of home ownership. We can allow seniors to age in place. We can stop displacement in gentrifying neighborhoods. And so in addition to grants, they're starting revolving loan programs. And these either are programs where there's a loan guarantee, which means that let's say the bank will only extend credit if you want a loan of over $30,000 and many homeowners need a smaller loan, or you only get a loan if your credit score is 660 or above, and they say, we will guarantee that loan, all of it or some of it, if you extend credit to those folks. And the best example on that is Cleveland Heights outside of Cleveland, Ohio. They put $160,000 in a certificate of deposit, a CD in a bank, key bank. And over the years, they have been able to guarantee $6 million worth of loans. Seems like a good investment, huh? Philadelphia, <coughs> excuse me, and the Healthy Row House Project that I helped to found um, has taken a different tax. And they raised their real estate transfer tax by 0.1%, which was enough to service the debt on a $40 million bond. And now in addition to their grant program, they have a loan program where they will provide loans the size of $5,000 to $25,000 to homeowners with credit scores as low as 580. And it just started and we're gonna see what that $40 million leverage, but it's really important to understand that no owner wants to live in a place that's deteriorated, they just don't have that capacity. And so giving them that capacity, particularly in a loan program where you can recycle that money over and over and over, or when you guarantee private capital coming from a bank may make sense for your jurisdiction. So now I am available to answer questions um, and I need, I guess, a couple minutes to just look through these here because um, so um, thank you for sending your questions. Um, and let me see what I can do. We've got 16 questions so far. So um, the state that upheld the $6,000 vacant property registration fee, that is the city of Minneapolis. And uh, I do not have a citation on me now, but if you want to email me at 
Kay Black at May 8 Consulting, I'd be happy to share it with you. Um, what are some strategies that can be applied to commercial vacant and blighted properties? Um, many of these same strategies can be used. If you have a commercial property in your downtown, on your main street, that is a health and safety risk, you can contact that owner, right? And, and the health and safety risk can be that there are rodents coming out of it. Right? And, and, you know, you got rats coming down the street, that's a health and safety risk. Or you can tell from the outside that there's severe water damage. I don't know about in your town, but we in Philadelphia have had some horrific situations where buildings have literally fallen down um, unexpectedly. Some of them were, you know, noted as dangerous, but hit people, hit pedestrians. Um, we have had warehouse fires where there was something flammable in there and the owner hadn't done anything about it. So um, these are real health and safety risks. So you can use the nuisance abatement laws. You can uh, use a vacant property registration, which applies to commercial properties as well. And what many places have done, and San Diego has this great example, and you can find their form online, where if you have a vacant property, you have to register. You have to have a local agent who they can call at any time if there's a problem with that property. And you have to file an action plan, um, which says this is how I'm going to sell it or reactivate it so that it's not long-term vacant. Um, and that gets you talking to those owners, identifies those owners, um, and has been really helpful in some places. So the next question is, for cities and states without home rule, is it advisable to require a vacant or rental property registration without state legislation? So state authorizing legislation is required for an awful lot of these tools. Um, I've been working since 2004 in Pennsylvania, and we've gotten about 14 different laws passed. And it's really important um, because the old laws just don't do the job. And you can see I'm kind of turning back for a second because for those of you who want to dig deep, um, there's a book on the right-hand side of this uh, that just came out two weeks ago called Vacant and Problem Properties, A Guide to Legal Strategies and Remedies. Um, and uh, I wrote a chapter in this book mainly talking about how cities have expanded the tools they're able to use based on state authorized new laws. Because we had these tools for years, right? Eminent domain, I said since 1945, but it's really expensive and controversial. Foreclosure, right? We've had these foreclosure laws since the 1920s, but they're directed at gaining back those revenues, and they're based on a theory that no one would walk away from their property, right? It's their biggest asset, they would never do it. Well, they're doing it, and we actually don't just want to collect past revenues, what we want to do is reactivate that property, and that's required a whole series of new rules, and New York has the zombie law, Somebody just asked about that, and it's, it's all online. They also have 19A in New York, which basically says um, if you have a commercial property that is not tax delinquent, so the owner is paying their taxes but not taking care of their property because they're just mothballing it for a better day when they can make some money, you can go into the court and as a municipality, you can gain ownership of that property if they fail to bring it up to code. It's complex, so I don't wanna make it seem too easy, um, but um, there are all these tools and this book, uh, which is available on the ABA, American Bar Association website, um, and I think it's, there's a link to it on my, oh, I don't know if it's on my homepage yet, sorry. Uh, but again, kblack at may8consulting.com if you really want to get a hold of something that I'm just not uh, telling you about. 
Um, what is the jurisdiction that implemented rental registration and rental licensing? A ton of jurisdictions around the country have uh, implemented one or the other. I mean, it's incredibly uh, popular as a tool because if you think about it, um, an awful lot of our rental stock, as well as our vacant property stock, are owned by LLCs. And LLCs, limited liability partnerships, allow you to own a property which is at 9 State Street called the 9 State Street LLC. And often it asks you for address, and the address of 9 State Street LLC is 9 State Street. So now you have absolutely no information as to who is responsible. And this becomes even more important, by the way, as you are foreclosing on properties, right? You want to give decent notice. And when you're foreclosing on a property, what more and more jurisdictions are doing is they're starting to set up a process where you have to become an eligible bidder. So in the past, in most tax sales, anyone could bid a tax sale. So that person who has 13 properties with serious code violations can come by more. That just continues the cycle of blight, right? But if you say that to be an eligible buyer, you have to list every property that you own or have an interest in as part of an LLC, and you have to sign an affidavit saying there are no outstanding code violations. Some of the counties who run the tax sales are actually sending that person's name and all the lists of LLCs to the jurisdictions and saying you don't get the property for 10 days or 15 days while they check to make sure that's true, right? You start to break up the cycle of blight. And that fits in with my next questions around foreclosure and why it's not uh, a good system for today's markets and why land banks in most places allow you to take properties out of foreclosure, not just give them to the highest bidder, but put them in a land bank that can then only sell them for a specific use to an owner who has capacity and proven ability to reactivate the property for that use. It's a lot more, um, effective. So um, a couple of you asked about the role that nonprofits and neighborhood organizations can play in identification of vacant properties and enforcement. Um, many jurisdictions, in order to start their initial database, particularly those that just don't have much capacity, have had citizens report which are vacant properties. Um, it is always better in my mind to use available data. So one of you asked about proxies for vacancy. So if you really don't know what's vacant, there is water shutoff. Who has their water shut off? Yes, they could still be living in that property, but probably not. And for those of you who have a lot of seasonal housing, you want to do that, look at water shops during the season. So that'll give you a sense. If you want to identify which are seasonal, maybe you want to do it during the summer when everyone's there and also during the winter to see which are seasonal. Electrical use, you can get your utility to share that with you and very low electrical use is another proxy for vacancy. And although they charge for it, the postal service will tell you places that they believe are vacant based on no one picking up mail and it just piling up. But let me get back to, <laughs> I'm seeing all these questions coming through. Um, the neighborhood organization can play a really important role because they can, um, one, identify places that are deteriorated. Two, we have had a few situations where judges have said, uh, you only have one picture of one day where this person was in violation. I'm going to give them another three months to uh, remediate it uh, because, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. You show a picture of a place that looks like it's just in terrible shape, um, 
another jurisdiction took a picture every month and brought it to the court six months later, and the judge only fined them for the days where there were pictures, so six days, as if the owner cleaned it up and then got it in bad shape again, right? Um, so having a neighbor or a nonprofit that can come in and take a picture every day, right, can make a big difference. Um, let's see. If a city doesn't have any true code enforcement or even zoning, where do you start? Well, you start by putting laws in place, right? Um, so you need that legal framework. The International Property Maintenance Code is out there. You can customize it, but experts have come up with it. And then you really need to convince your leadership that code enforcement will pay for itself and it will create a culture of owners taking care of their property. Zoning is not necessary for code enforcement. Places like Houston that have no zoning can still do code enforcement. We don't care what use your property is put to or where it is with respect to whether it's right near the street or set back from the street, but you still have to keep it in safe condition and so it's not a hazard to others. Um, again, I'm getting lots of questions about city leaders and code enforcement budgets. Um, the courts have said again and again that you can charge in fees a sufficient amount to pay for the administration of the property. Minneapolis is $6,000 per vacant property. They were able to show that they took the hundreds of vacant properties, they multiplied it by 6,000, and they said, this is what it costs, not only to send code enforcement folks out, but to have fire and police personnel respond to squatters there, and to board it up and to reboard it up, and to take care of everything involved in these vacant properties because they are costly. So um, I started with that Philadelphia study um, showing what the true cost of vacancy is. And you may want to do one of those, asking your local community college or university if they can put together these numbers. And of course, of course, lost home equity is the biggest number because if that vacant property is really bringing down values by 30% in the property surrounding it, you can see how that number is going to get pretty big and people care a great deal about that. Um, someone wants to see the study about reducing gun violence. Uh, so it is the two, the study uh, by the University of Pennsylvania on the windows and doors ordinance in Philadelphia. And uh, the key author was Charles Bronis, B-R-A-N-A-S. So if you search Charles Bronis, uh, crime, vacant property at the University of Pennsylvania, you should be able to find it pretty easily. Okay, um, I have just three minutes. I'm just taking a look to see if I can uh, answer one more question. And there's so many here, but there's one that's great, which is talking about rural areas. I'm working in rural uh, New York. Uh, I was just there all week. I'm working in other rural areas. And, you know, they always said that Fred Astaire danced beautifully, but Ginger Rogers had to do it backwards and in heels. And that's how I feel about rural places, right? They have to do things like code enforcement with so much less capacity, uh, knowing everyone. And it's really, really difficult. Uh, but uh, some of them are doing an incredible job. And they're doing an incredible job because they're not looking towards the past and saying, we want a time when everyone took care of their property, but instead they're offering incentives. Uh, this one rural area I was just in is doing a rock the block where they are taking a large block because, you know, rural areas, there's a lot less density, so each property is farther apart. And they're going in with some volunteer contractors and a whole bunch of other volunteers 
and they're helping to fix things up. They're also using code enforcement, uh, and they're outsourcing it to an engineering firm because they don't want to hire full-time employees. They have very few, um, and so they just want to hire a firm to do it once a year and come out, and then their employees will take care of the follow-up and the enforcement. They also said one of their key issues, which I'll end on, is banks. So foreclosed property registration is another option that many states have used, which basically says that when a property is 90 days delinquent, a lender has to register it as a property in the process of foreclosure, and that that bank or lender is responsible for caring for the property during that process. Um, and that's been huge for rural areas because they didn't know how to get through to Wells Fargo, whoever the lender was, and to get them to their location. Um, for foreclosure registration, there are for-profit firms across the country that know all the contacts at the banks and will do all the paperwork for a municipality for half the fee. So the bank pays a $50 fee per property uh, and then agrees to keep it up and that for-profit will keep half of that. The tools are numerous, there is no magic bullet, but we are making incredible progress and I really thank you for joining me for this hour. Justin, anything we need to say before we let folks get back to work? No, that's it. I just want to say thank you to you, Karen, for hosting this really great presentation and give a thanks to everyone who joined us this afternoon. Um, our next webinar is going to take place on June 27th, so please check out our website for more information on that and any other upcoming webinars, and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.